when I was about 11 years old, I did the thing that a lot of uh, young kids did back in the day. Um, I signed up for a mission trip, and uh, we were going to Mexico, and I thought, you know, hey, I'm going to go do some good things, going to serve a little bit, uh, go be a part of this trip, and, you know, maybe bless some people. Uh, but what I didn't know when I was 11 years old is that uh, when we submit ourselves to the Lord, uh, when we choose to, uh, we call it engage missionally here, uh, what often ends up happening is rather than being the blessing, we're the recipients of the blessing. Uh, when I went to Mexico as a young kid, uh, I, I had a couple of realizations that really happen for almost everyone who uh, visits a third world country. Uh, the first one, you know, you show up and you see people living in really substantial poverty. Uh, the first realization is, uh, and these people don't have all the things that I have. Like, gosh, their houses were uh, really crude, tiny little structures, uh, you know, eight feet by eight feet, and that's where the family would live. And uh, oftentimes didn't have a door or there's like plastic bags used as wall material. And uh, you, I saw hunger for the first time. Um, Moms and dads who aren't able to provide for their kids well, um, they don't have adequate clothing. Uh, it, it's just a different world. And so you, you see it and you recognize, man, these people don't have everything that I have. Uh, but then the, the second realization hit me uh, over time as I was there, uh, and it, it's one that we, we often see, again, in, in third world countries as Americans, um, Although they didn't have everything that I had, um, they certainly had something that I didn't. And as I looked at these kids, the young kids, I would play soccer with them during the day. And, uh, you know, seeing them in their poverty, they had a joy. They had a happiness. And they had a contentment that I didn't. I had ten times more stuff. And yet they had this happiness, this joy, this contentment that I couldn't seem to grasp at. I want to submit to you today um, that one of the great lies that the enemy has told the American church is that if we just had, and then fill in the blank, then we would be happy. If we, could, if we just had the, the thing, we just had the relationship, we just had the stuff, and you fill in the blank with whatever it might be, then we will be happy. And it's kind of led to this American consumer Christianity where we're always grasping for the next thing. And we think, hey, this thing will make us happy. When I was a kid, uh, it was Air Jordans, saved up that mowing money, you know, the allowance, and I was going to get the shoes, and I convinced myself that if I could just get those shoes, then life would be perfect. People would like bow down down as I walk by, like life would be glorious if I had a pair of Air Jordans on. And uh, I remember saving my money, found a deal at the store, got my Air Jordans, and it was really good for a couple of days. And then they got dirty and smelly like every other pair of shoes that I'd ever owned. And then I needed a pair of the, remember the pump up tennis shoes, pump the air in, you know what I mean? I, it, it went on and on and on and on. One of the great lies that the enemy has told the American church is that if we just had the thing, then we too would be happy. Then we could be satisfied. Then we would, would feel uh, a contentment in our lives. My experience as an 11-year-old boy showed me that that's, that's an outright lie. And what Satan has done is he's, he's kind of dangled the carrot in front of our noses and he's made us really, really busy. He's caused us to chase after thing, after thing, after thing, after thing, after thing. And in pursuing all the things, we've missed the one thing that was most important. Today I want to talk to you about contentment in Christ. Contentment in Christ Jesus and really contentment in Christ alone. The Apostle Paul is going to talk to the Philippian believers about that. Uh, but before we get there, I want, to, I want to maybe point out that when I talk about contentment today, what I'm not talking about is merely financial contentment. Oftentimes, well, let's just take a minute and let you think about it. When I utter that statement, if I just had blank, then I would be happy, then I would be satisfied, then I would be content. What would you fill that blank in with? For uh, some people, it's, it's a relationship. 
for some people and they're single. I was 26 years old when I got married, and uh, on a weekly basis, like, I would walk through the church, and all the old ladies would kind of beat me up about it, like, when are you going to find you a pretty young lady, you know, and if not, here's my granddaughter. Like, I went through that for years of my life. Like, what's wrong? There must be something missing because you don't have a spouse, and maybe you feel that. And maybe you're believing the lie that if you just had the husband, you just had the wife, then you'd be content. If you're a younger person, maybe it's a boyfriend or girlfriend. Or to maybe take it a step further, maybe you're a married person. And as if I just had a different husband, or if I just had a different wife, then I would be content. For others of you, it might not be a romantic relationship, but maybe it's a relationship with a mom or a dad. Maybe it's the approval of your peers. Maybe it's people to applaud you, to tell you that you're worthy, that you're valuable, that you're important. And the problem with that is kind of like the shoes, they wear out, it gets old, and you need some more. So some people fill that blank in with relationships. If I just had that person, that relationship, that approval, that acceptance, if I could just make my dad proud, then I would feel satisfied. Other people, it isn't uh, relationships, but it's things. And so for you, it might be, if I could just have the house, man, if I could, I could just live in that neighborhood, I could just have central heat and air, praise Jesus, right? If I could just have that thing, that house, that place, then I would be content. I would never want anything else. Like my heart would be satisfied. Life would be good. But then you get the house. And then you got to remodel the house, clearly, right? And then you got to redecorate the house. And then you need the patio and the pool and the outdoor kitchen and on and on and on it goes. Maybe it's not a house, it's a car. Maybe for you it's a bank account, a retirement account, and the college fund. If I could just get it there, then I would be content. And again, it's just a lie from the enemy. Because there's nothing in all of creation that will ever satisfy the deepest longings of our heart. It's not relationships or uh, possessions or things. Maybe for you, it's circumstances. Maybe for you, when you would fill in the blank, uh, if I just had, maybe you'd fill in that blank with health. Maybe for you, this is a season of, uh, well, there's been a diagnosis. You're afraid. You're worried about what's to come. And you begin thinking about life in terms of if we could just get on the other side of cancer. If we could just get on the other side of this injury or this ailment, then my heart would be happy. I would be content. If I could just get through this season of loss, then I could be content. And many of us, whether we realize this or not, we're always like we fill the, that, that word, that blank, we fill it in with our circumstances. And so for many of us, we don't enjoy our lives because we're just living for the next weekend. If I can just get through the week, then I can enjoy this weekend. Or if I can just get to my vacation, then I can start to really live. If I can just get to the next thing, change of circumstances, then I will be content. The problem for every single one of us and every person who's ever lived, is that you and I were made, created, to have a relationship with the creator of the world, to live in a relationship with him. And if we don't settle that, and I'm not talking about like walked an aisle, prayed a prayer, uh, but, but rather think about Adam and Eve walking and talking with God in the garden, communing with their creator. If you don't commune with your heavenly father, you will never be content. There will always be this deep longing in your soul, and you're going to believe that the next thing or the next thing or the next thing or the next thing is going to satisfy you, but it never will. On and on and on it will go. So the Apostle Paul is going to speak to the believers in Philippi, and he's going to talk to them about contentment, and he's going to do so to a group of people who were living in rather difficult circumstances. They were supposed to, they were believers in Jesus Christ. They're going to go out and they're going to declare the gospel, but they'd watched as Paul was beaten with rods. They watched as he was thrown in prison. They'd seen his treatment. Paul had promised them they were going to suffer. 
And so the Apostle Paul, he begins to speak to them. Uh, uh, today we're going to see that they were giving him a gift, actually. Uh, while he was there, the church had taken up some money. They'd supported Paul. Uh, but then he'd been gone for quite some time. And so Paul's going to thank them for their gift and kind of talk to them a bit about the future. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse 10. The Apostle Paul says this, he says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Now concern here, this was a financial gift. Uh, if you remember Epaphroditus, we talked about him several weeks ago. It was Epaphroditus who brought this monetary gift to Paul. Now he uses the word revived here, which means it was previously alive and then it was diminished or dead, and now it's been revived. So Paul's saying, hey, you supported me before, and now that concern has been revived. You've supported me again, so I'm rejoicing greatly in the Lord as a result of this gift. Now at last you have revi revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. So I mean, Paul was a traveling evangelist, basically. I mean, he would plant churches, preach the gospel. He was a hard guy to keep up with. So when he was in Philippi, they had blessed him. Uh, but if you know the recent events of Paul's life, he was preaching the gospel across the known world at the time uh, and, and upsetting people everywhere he went, so he didn't get to stay very long. Uh, he had been arrested and sent to Rome. He'd appealed to Caesar, and so he was going to stand before Caesar in Rome. But along the way, he was shipwrecked. Spent some time stranded on an island, bitten by a snake there, by the way. And, and finally, he's found himself in prison in Rome. And so it's likely that this was the first time that Paul was stationary long enough for them to figure out, okay, Paul is in Rome, he's in prison, and then to send a gift again. And so he's rejoicing at the gift that they sent, like, hey, thank you guys for reviving your concern for me. But he wants to be really clear about something. I, I, I don't know that I would ever do this if you uh, were to walk up to me and be like, hey, felt like I needed to bless you, you gave me a, a decent sum of money. I don't know that I would start here, but Paul did because he wanted to teach them about contentment in Christ. Verse 11, he says, not that I speak from want. Like, hey, I appreciate the money, but I didn't really need it. It wasn't all that important. I, I wouldn't tell you that. I'd be like, oh, thank you. I, this really met a big need, right? That's, that would be my, my tendency. And yet Paul wants more for them than just their giving. He wasn't out for, hey, to get the money. It wasn't about the gift. He says, not that I speak from want. For I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Hey, I, I appreciate the gift, but I want you to know that even if you hadn't given the gift, uh, I, could, I could walk in contentment. Even as I find myself in chains in Rome, about to go before Caesar to find out whether I live or I die. Even though the accommodations here aren't so good, even though I'm probably not getting three squares a day in a Roman prison, I want you to know that even if you hadn't given, I would have been content. I've learned that. Now, uh, when, he, when he says, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in, now, some, some people would think about Christianity in terms of... Um, Almost like God downloading some information in your brain. Like, I got saved, received the Spirit, now I've got uh, everything, it's in me, I'm good. Uh, but that's really not how it works for us. As a matter of fact, what Christianity is, is it's learning to follow Christ as He leads us step by step, day by day, circumstance by circumstance. And so the Greek word here where He says, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances, is the Greek word manthano. It's where we get our modern day word for math. I don't know if you know much about math, but it does, we don't just know the answer all the time, especially to the more complex problems. Like it takes some work. You've got to write some things out. You've got to take some time to figure in order to arrive at the proper conclusion. And so Paul's like, listen, I have learned what it is to be content in whatever circumstance I've faced. And he's going to go on. He's going to list a bunch of different ones for, for us. But as believers in Christ, if you're here today, you've trusted Jesus Christ as Lord, here's what I want you to know. God wants you to be content in whatever circumstances that you find yourself in. And I don't know what your situation is today. Man, this might be a time of, of incredible difficulty for you. Maybe it's something that people know about, and maybe it's something that's just inside of you. I was like, I've learned to be content. What does he mean here? When we talk about contentment, um, what, is, what does it mean to be content? Because that's an important thing. If we're going to learn it and be that, what does it mean for us to be content? So I'm going to define it for you. Uh, to be content is, is to be satisfied. 
It's, it's to, to say, you know what, I, I've got enough. Like I'm at rest. I'm not seeking after other things. I have uh, that which I need to be full. Uh, contentment, the feeling of satisfaction with one's relationships, possessions, or circumstances. The opposite of content is to be dissatisfied with relationships, possessions, or circumstances. Discontent comes from the belief that we need something that we do not have. If I just had this, then I would be satisfied. When you think about your life, the things you're seeking after, the things you're striving for, how would you answer that question? If I just had blank, then I would be satisfied. Then I would have enough. Then I would be full. Then I could stop striving. Paul writes to the church at Philippi. Hey, listen, appreciate your gift, but even if I didn't receive it, I want you to know that I could find contentment there. I've learned what it is to be content, content in my circumstances. You and I can learn to be content in our circumstances. He goes on to describe the circumstances that he's, he's living in here. He says, I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Now, these are some pretty uh, substantial circumstances here. Now, Paul had previously been trained under Gamaliel. He's like Ivy League, right? I mean, he'd, he'd been, he went to Harvard, right? He's been there with the big dogs. He's run with them. He'd purchased his own Roman citizenship, and that didn't come cheap. Paul had known what it was to have plenty, but he also knew what it was to live in poverty. You know, in every circumstance, we have what we need to be content. In prosperity or in poverty. Paul's like, listen, I know the secret to this. Whether you're in a palace or you're in prison, whether you're in prosperity or you're in poverty, I know the secret. To feeling full, to being satisfied, to having enough, to being content with the life that we're living. I know the secret to it. And he's going to tell us. But before he does that, He's going to even deepen this for us a bit more in terms of the circumstances surrounding his contentment. Yeah, I know how to live in humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. Uh, I don't know if you all went through this, but when you're younger and you have absolutely nothing, uh, you know the young poor days, uh, whether maybe you just you know, get out of high school and you move into your own place, which was probably a mistake. Like, you know, people make fun of young kids for living with their parents for a long time, but I'm like, man, that was brilliant. Like, think about how much money I could have saved. Like, I should have done that. Not really. If you're a young kid, like, go be on your own, right? You're an adult. Do it. But regardless, uh, when, when Brittany and I were first married, man, times were tough. Like, we didn't have anything. Like, if you had a couch and you were throwing it away, we're like, no, 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 I'll take that. That's an upgrade for us. Like, we lived in those days where uh, we lived in this tiny little house, and I mean, we just thought it was awesome. We didn't have any money for anything. But as we look back on the, those days, we look back on them with joy. We didn't have money to think, oh, we can buy this or go and do that. Man, we just, we had our little family at that time living in that little house. It was just Logan and me and, and Brittany, and we're like, oh, those were such good days. Those were really hard days, but they were good days. You know why? Because in our humble circumstances of those days, we were content. But isn't it odd that we can be content in humble means, but not be content when you have a little bit more money in your pocket? When you can buy the thing that maybe you've been wanting or the, you know, whatever you might fill that blank in with, you can attain the next thing. And suddenly before long, you're like, not only do I want that, but I want that thing and that thing. And we begin to live this life and run this race where we're pursuing contentment in possessions rather than our creator. Paul's like, I, listen, I figured it out. There's a secret. Humble circumstances in prosperity but he goes beyond that. He says, in any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry. I want you to think about that. It's like, I've learned to be content when I've had plenty and when I'm feeling the pangs of hunger, when my body literally doesn't have enough food. 
I've learned how to be content there of having abundance and suffering need. Like I've learned how to be satisfied. I've learned how to have enough, how to be filled even when I'm suffering need. And he's going to utter one of the most quoted and misquoted verses in all of the Bible to tell us this is the secret to contentment. Philippians 4.13, he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul's like, listen, it's not my relationships. It's not my possessions. It's not my circumstances that will ever bring contentment. It's Christ Jesus, the Lord. It's in seeking after him. He's the one that empowers me to be content no matter what's going on when I got plenty and when I don't have enough. If you remember, he's talked about, uh, when he talked about sending Timothy to the Philippian church, he was talking about the other believers. He's like, I can't depend upon anybody else. Like the relationship thing for Paul was pretty thin and he was about to send Timothy away because people needed him. People were preaching the gospel out of envy and rivalry, wishing to do Paul harm. Relationships were pretty thin. Possessions, scarce. His circumstances, pretty harsh. And I've learned the secret to being alone and having nothing in the most difficult of circumstances. I can do it through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Like I could seek after all those things and they would never satisfy. But when I seek after Christ, my heart is satisfied. Those deep longings of my soul, they were never filled by all the things of creation, but it can be filled by the Creator. He's like, he's like hey, hey, listen, you can be content in your circumstances too. It's, it's, it's empowered by Jesus Christ, by walking with Him, by getting the thing that your heart truly longs for. But our enemy comes in, our nation, the most prosperous nation in the history of the world, and like dangling a carrot in front of our eyes, says, hey, you know what, if you just had this, then you'd be satisfied. If you just had that relationship, man, life would be smooth sailing. You'd never want for anything again. Just a little more money in that 401k and you'll be taken care of. A few more possessions. Just get through this season. Man, just, just make it to retirement. Then you can coast. And we run and we run and we run and we run after thing after thing after thing and our hearts are never truly f- satisfied. The Apostle Paul says, you want to know the secret? Satisfaction, contentment, it is found in Christ alone. If you want to find contentment, you've got to change what you seek. And begin to seek after Jesus Christ. He's enough. Jesus told a parable in Luke chapter 8. You might know as the parable of the sower or the parable of the soils. And he says, the kingdom of God is like a a sower who goes out and he starts to scatter some seed. And the first type of soil is is like the seed that got scattered on a a hard path. And very quickly, man, the the birds came up. They stole the seed away. It never took root, never never germinated, never began to grow. Uh, It was just lost. The second is like seed that was scattered among rocky soil. It kind of germinated. It began to spring up before it really ever uh, bore any fruit, though, because the soil was shallow. Um, It wilted and it went away. The third type uh, is to see the seed that's sowed among, uh, among thorns. Now, everything is right among the soil there, but it, it's really just the thorns, they grow up and they choke out, and so it's never fruitful. And then the, the fourth type of soil, um, the seed sowed on the good soil, man, it grows up and it produces a harvest. One seed turns into a hundred seeds, 60 seeds, 30, like there's a great harvest that's ultimately reaped there. And the disciples, they asked Jesus, because they often needed to, hey, what do you mean by that? Like, what do those soils represent? He's like, well, the, the first type of soil is when the seed is scattered and, uh, like, the, the gospel is shared and, and for whatever reason, there's distraction. The enemy comes and steals it away before it ever takes root. And the enemy steals that away and, and no benefit comes from that at all. 
And the, the second type of soil is when the, the gospel is shared, but the moment temptation comes, those people are out, right? They, they kind of hear it. They, they receive the word maybe in their minds, but they didn't receive Jesus as Lord in their heart. They never started to follow him. And all of a sudden, when temptation or difficulty comes, man, it's, it's gone. But Jesus, what about that third type of soil? Jesus is like, hey, the soil is actually really good. It's got everything it needs to sustain life, to thrive, to bear fruit. That one seed could see a hundredfold return, but it didn't. Because there were other things going up in that soil too. So many other things that grew up, but they choked out what that seed was intended to do. And it was never fruitful. Church of America, Cross Community Church, this is us. I believe that God wants to do a profound work in us and through us. And it's not as if we're lacking anything. Like, Jesus, in Christ, we have everything we need for life and godliness. We've been given the Word. We've been given the Holy Spirit, which raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Like, everything is present that ought to be present in order for a a, a substantial harvest to be reaped. But if we look around us, man, there's just too many other things in our life. We're chasing after this thing and that thing and success and achievement and pats on the back and more financial success. All the things, and so much so that you know what the number one excuse I hear when I talk to people about, hey, have you been spending time in the Word? Have you been pursuing Jesus Christ? You know what the number one thing I hear from people? Hey, listen, I've been really busy. I've been so busy chasing after all the things that don't matter that I haven't been able to seek after the one thing that will satisfy my soul, the one thing that will grow up and bear fruit in my life. We look and we kind of complain about the state of our world, about our society, about what we see when we go out into our community. But you know whose responsibility it is to bear fruit. You see, the sower went out to sow the seed and hope that that seed would grow up and that it would bear a harvest a hundredfold, a hundred times what was ultimately planted, that more seeds could go and be planted. But among the church of Jesus Christ, we're so busy with all the stuff that doesn't matter that we haven't focused on the one thing that has the potential not only to transform our lives, but transform the world. Paul's like, can can I just tell you the secret here? And I've done it without any friends. And I've had people by my side. I've traveled with Luke. And I've had Timothy, and I've been alone. And I've known wealth. And I've known hunger. I've had really good circumstances. And I've been in a Roman prison in chains, facing what could be a potential death sentence. And through every one of those things, there is one thing that matters. And it is Christ who empowers and strengthens and fills, who supplies everything that we need. You want to know the secret? It's not the stuff. It's not the circumstance. It's not the relationship. It's Christ. In seeking to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus, We've kind of bet the farm on six practices, six things. Devoting ourselves daily. We get up, we commune with the Lord. Spending time in His Word and in prayer. Walking throughout our day with Christ. Gathering consistently with the body of Jesus to be reminded of the work of Christ on our behalf. Worshiping together walking in community with other believers so that we're not out there alone trying to make it. Maybe if we stumble, there's someone there to help us up. We've asked people to serve faithfully using the gifts. Listen, you were created in Christ Jesus for good works, using your gifts then to to do the thing that Jesus has created you to do. We've asked people to give sacrificially, to engage missionally. And all of that in hope that you will become a fully devoted disciple, that the seeds of the gospel that have been planted in your life would grow up to fruition, that they would scatter out across the known 
world as people are coming and they're going and you get to go on a vacation or you, you, you get to travel for work, you take the gospel with you. But we've got to give ourselves to the things that give our heart to Christ. For many of us, like everything is present. But there's just too many things in our lives that are competing with the work of God in us. Every week, at the end of my sermon, I, I set aside time, and it's a time of response, where I ask you to hear the word of the Lord that's been preached over you, and to respond in obedience. So in just a minute, the band's going to come up here, and they're going to play, and what I want to ask you to do is just pray to the Lord and say, would you search my heart, Lord? Would you kind of search through the soil of my life and show me the things that don't belong? The things that are choking out the work that you desire to do in me? Would you just submit yourself to God and say, God, listen, I, I want you to bear fruit in my life. I want you to do the thing. Don't spend another day running the race, taking the bait, believing the lie that anything of all of creation will ever satisfy the longings of your soul. Today, would you submit your heart to Christ and say, God, I'm going to pursue the one thing that will be, bring contentment and satisfaction. Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus, man, we live in a world that everywhere we turn, it's another carrot. It's another thing. And God, you've given us affluence. You've given us money. You've given us time, you've given us health, and God, we can waste those things so easily on things that don't produce any return. Father, we live in a time of spiritual and physical poverty, and you've given us the resources to begin to alleviate those things. Lord, I pray that we'd be faithful with our time and our money and our energy, Lord, to go out into the world and to, to bring light into the midst of darkness. God, would you reveal the things that are competing with you in our hearts? And God, would you just rip those things out by the root? We submit ourselves to you. Would you have your way in us? I pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.